Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'd like to start out by thanking the conference organizers for inviting me to present some of my work today. My name is Dr. Coy Allen. I'm an associate professor of immunology at Virginia Tech. And today we'll be presenting some of our work focused on hystertripsy and its role in modulating the immune system during cancer therapy. Our laboratory focuses on a variety of different types of cancer. Today we'll be focusing on our pancreatic cancer research. And in the data presented today, you will see findings from mouse studies, pig studies, veterinary clinical trials, and human clinical trials. Uh, and in the data presented, uh, these icons will be shown to reflect where the data were generated. We're fortunate at Virginia Tech to have several different uh, colleges involved in our tumor ablation research programs. Uh, today, we'll be talking mostly about hystertripsy, but we have uh, quite a bit of experience in a variety of different tumor ablation modalities, including HIFU, radiotherapy, and cryotherapy, uh, also irreversible electroporation. So for those that aren't familiar with hystertripsy, hystertripsy causes tumor ablation through uh, cavitation. Uh, basically, a bubble cloud is generated in the ablation zone. Uh, there are a lot of advantages to hystertripsy. For example, we can generate precise margins. It allows real-time image guidance. Uh, for example, this is the bubble cloud in a mouse memory tumor. You can see the ablated zone here. We also get immediate treatment feedback, and hystertripsy can also be tissue-specific. To evaluate hystertripsy in the context of pancreatic cancer, uh, we typically utilize rodent models, such as the mouse PANO2 model. This is a very well-characterized model of pancreatic cancer. Uh, this is a pancreatic cancer cell line from black six mice. Uh, we have generated a custom-built small animal hystertripsy system for our mouse treatments. And this is an image of a pancreatic tumor. We are utilizing the subcutaneous model. Uh, and so this is a sub-Q pancreatic tumor here outlined in red. Our treatment zone is outlined in orange and the bubble cloud is here in green. In our model, uh, we usually treat the animal seven to 10 days after tumor implantation with hystertripsy. This is based on tumor size. Uh, we have multiple harvest time points across the time course. Our immediate time point is immediately after treatment. This is usually to evaluate the ablation zone, uh, followed by 24 hours post. We're calling this an acute harvest. And then we have multiple time points. Some of the days today will be from day seven, day 14, and from our survival studies. And survival in this model typically uh, spans out 42 to 51 days. Because we're evaluated, because we're interested in evaluating the immune response, uh, we are purposely undertreating the tumors. And as you can see here, treatment is on day seven. Uh, we see a, a significant reduction in tumor progression following treatment. The treatment is the orange line or the treated tumors are the orange lines. This is significantly different from our untreated tumors, which aren't treated. Uh, you can see they, they continue along a, a fairly steady uh, course of progression. Uh, and then even though we are under treating, I want to point out that we do get significant improvements in survival. Our overall mortality is improved. Uh, here is a, an example of what we call progression-free survival. You can see a significant difference in the treated versus untreated animals. So in our immune assessments, uh, one of the first things we typically assess is the tumor microenvironment. And so here we remove the tumors and we evaluate the cells pre and post treatment. Uh, and one of the, the one of the most consistent observations that we find are that following hystertripsy treatment, we have a decrease in our, in our immunosuppressive immune cells. So in pancreatic cancer, there, there's a very potent immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. Uh, and a large driver of this are the immunosuppressive cell types that are present. Uh, following treatment, we typically see a decrease in myeloid derived suppressor cells and tumor associated macrophages. Uh, in some of our models, we also see uh, some, some tumor associated neutrophils, uh, which also are ablated. Basically, all of these immunosuppressive cells in the microenvironment are ablated. We can evaluate this using histopathology. Typically, we utilize H&E characterization and then immunohistochemistry to, to give us some spatial data about where these cells are located, uh, follow it pre and post ablation. Typically, a few days after ablation, we begin to see an influx of more pro-inflammatory cell types, uh, T cells, for example, uh, and, and in some cases, neutrophils as well. We can also evaluate this using flow cytometry to quantify the numbers of cells to, to get a better idea of the types of cells that are present and in what numbers. Complementing this, we also are, are interested in some of the signaling pathways that are altered following treatment. So hystertripsy 
fully ablates cells that are in the ablation zone. Uh, however, the cells that survive that ablation and some of the cells on the margins respond to that. Uh, they respond to that ablation. Uh, and typically what they're responding to are uh, damage associated molecular patterns. And so we have done over the last, over the last five, five to seven years, we've been really interested in exploring the signals that are released following ablation. And in the context of histotripsy, we've identified several damage associated molecular patterns, for example, HMGB1 uh, shown here, uh, and its role in signaling post-treatment. Uh, you can see HMGB1 is significantly increased both locally and in the serum following histotripsy treatment. Uh, here's the HMGB1 in the treated animals. HMGB1 is a very potent damage associated molecular pattern. When it's sensed in the extracellular microenvironment, it will trigger an innate immune response, typically through pattern recognition receptor signaling and recognition. Uh, this creates a pro-inflammatory microenvironment. Uh, in our evaluations using transcriptomics and proteomics and looking at signaling pathways, we've identified several key pro-inflammatory mediators, such as interferon gamma and IL-6. They're locally produced at very high levels following histotripsy. This triggers that shift from immunosuppression to more pro-inflammation or more pro-inflammatory microenvironment, where we have uh, increased M1 macrophage activation, increased CD8 T cell activation and recruitment, and increased Th1 and Th17 signal. Uh, all the way around, when we look at the immune pathways being activated by this, uh, we, we routinely see HMGB1 signaling, NF-kappa B signaling, uh, and TLR signaling as well. So moving beyond what, what we really consider innate immune response signaling, we also see a significant increase in, in uh, adaptive immune system uh, signaling and regulation, uh, but much later in the day, in the 14 to 41 day time range. What we think is going on, our current hypothesis is that because histotripsy is non-thermal, we are getting an increase in neoantigen production. Uh, these antigens are uh, in, in they're more night their more native conformation. Because this is non-thermal, uh, we, we're, we're getting much better, much higher quality antigen presentation to activate our dendritic cells, which then uh, have a much more robust T cell response downstream. Uh, we can evaluate this using, for example, co-culture studies where we can treat uh, our PANO2 cells uh, with histotripsy in co-culture conditions with dendritic cells and T cells. And we can see that we get a very potent T cell uh, proliferation response. Uh, this is at different levels of, of histotripsy ablation of the PANO2 cells. Um, and we also get consistent increases in uh, cytokines like IL-2, which would reflect uh, increased T cell proliferation. This is important because the T cells are the cells that are becoming activated. They're driving increased systemic immune responses, such as decreased metastatic lesions. And ultimately, this can help prevent recurrence. Interestingly, uh, I noted, uh, we mentioned some of the cytokines and chemokines being produced. We routinely see increased levels of interferon gamma in our, in our uh, models following Mr. Tripsy treatment. This can trigger PDL1 expression. PDL1 under certain uh, under certain conditions can be interferon gamma inducible, uh, which we can see here when we block with interferon gamma, we don't see PDL1 expression. This is important because PDL1 is a potent checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a potent checkpoint and can uh, drive immunosuppression. So this would suggest that in some cell types, that interferon gamma production can result in increased PDL1 expression, which may impact that systemic inflammation that we that we want to induce. It could impact that systemic anti-tumor immune response. Uh, and this would also suggest that in cells, in, in tumor types where we have significant interferon gamma levels, uh, that these tumors may uh, be candidates for targeting with pdl one targeted therapeutics. Uh, it would also suggest that CTLA-4 therapeutics may not be as effective as a co-therapy with our histotripsy. So bringing it together, we've developed a working model of what we believe is is going on in the tumors following histotripsy. Uh, we have published this uh, earlier this year in Frontiers in Oncology, and you can get more information in that review. So bring it all together in terms of future directions, we're really interested in, in better evaluating these biomarkers and the, the co-therapeutics uh, using our rodent model systems. Our pig models, we recently developed pig models of pancreatic cancer. Uh, for example, you can see this is a pig pancreas where we put two uh, pancreatic tumors uh, beside the splenic vein here in the pancreas. 
Uh, so we have developed these, uh, these pancreatic models uh, to provide us with a more realistic orthotopic model that we can evaluate some of our, our, our therapeutic strategies. Uh, we are also moving forward with veterinary clinical studies. This is a veterinary patient with a pancreatic tumor. And uh, our, our goal is to move into human studies. Well, we are well on our way there. Uh, so ultimately, we are moving from or translating our data from, from bench to kennel to bedside. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Eli Vlasevich. We couldn't have done this work without him. He is our histotripsy person. Uh, and then the graduate students in my lab, Dr. Or Imran and, uh, and Alyssa, have been fantastic uh, at driving this. And uh, certainly, we couldn't have done this without our sponsors. And particularly, I'd like to point out the Focused Ultrasound Foundation for their financial support. Thank you, and I'll take any questions you may have.